This is Dr. Ted Schwartz. I work at Wild Cornell in New York Presbyterian Hospital in Manhattan. And this is Interview with a Surgeon with Surgeon Agent. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we have Dr. Ted Schwartz. Doc, how are we doing today? Doing great. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change throughout your fellowship? So when I was a resident, I was very interested in epilepsy and epilepsy surgery. And uh, I had spent some time doing research in epilepsy, and I had spent some time at the University of Washington with a guy named George Ogeman. And really, when I first got in neurosurgery, my main interest was how the brain is organized, how language is organized in the brain, how memory is organized, and to try to develop new ways of treating patients with epilepsy. And people who know me now know that, although that's still part of what I do, my practice has taken many turns and uh, done a lot of 180s and 360s and lefts and rights to get me where I am today, which required a lot of facile thinking and flexibility in terms of not being too overly single-minded. But I really went into neurosurgery to be very academic. I wanted to have a lab, do epilepsy research, and do epilepsy surgery. So can you kind of take us through your mentality going to your first job search process and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? So my priorities with my first job were to be in the New York area. I posed certain limitations because there are only a, a, a certain number of jobs in the New York area. And so I limited myself geographically, which made it very challenging. And then I also limited myself in terms of what I wanted to do, which was mainly do epilepsy research and epilepsy surgery. And so there were very few programs in the New York area that really wanted someone like me. And I think that limited my appeal when I was first entering the job search because I wasn't necessarily one of those guys who's like, going to a chairman and just said, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I just want to be here. Or, you know, I'm focused on, on this big volume uh, specialty that's going to bring in a lot of cases. You know, I was very niche oriented and very limited in what I wanted to do. And looking back, I realized that any chairman looking at me would have said, how is this guy going to support himself? Like, all he wants to do is epilepsy research and epilepsy surgery. That's really not a viable long-term business plan. Like if I had presented it as a business plan, it would have been a miserable uh, business plan. No one would have invested in me at the time. And I get that now in retrospect, but at the time it was my passion. And you know, I wasn't gonna let anyone dissuade me from doing the thing I wanted to do. There were major changes that occurred subsequent to that. But my first job was one where I was able to get uh, some lab space, which I wanted. Um, some startup funds, and the ability to do epilepsy surgery. Now, it turns out the lab space never materialized in my first job. The startup funds never materialized in my first job. And it was, a, it was also a frustrating uh, place to start out because the things that I really wanted to do were not happening. And so I quickly moved uh, to a new job within my first year. I pivoted very early to a second job. So I went from UMDNJ in New Jersey to Cornell in Manhattan. Uh, and I was living in Manhattan at the time, commuting in New Jersey. And when a job opened up that had an epilepsy center with no epilepsy surgeon uh, at a uh, you know academic medical center where I thought I could do epilepsy research and was able to get you know some startup funds and some lab space, it became more appealing. But but still, it was a very difficult prospect to try to just do and focus on epilepsy surgery. I was also interested in tumor surgery, but you know, it was not my primary focus at the time. And you know, the big lesson of my career, when I started at Cornell, I started doing their epilepsy surgery, and I started my lab, and I wrote a bunch of grants, and I got grant funding, and the lab was going great. And I was very passionate about my lab work, but the clinic, clinical work was not enough volume to really support me, particularly not living in Manhattan. And so there was a new field that was starting out uh, that, that focused on using the endoscope to do minimally invasive pituitary tumors. 
And because I'd always been interested in pituitary tumors, just as a side thing that I kind of like doing, I was pretty well trained in it from my first residency. I started doing pituitary tumors and I started going to courses and learning how to use the endoscope. And I became fascinated by how far I could go and the field would go because there was a lot of excitement at the time about, about extending endoscopic pituitary surgery to start taking out bigger and more difficult tumors around the skull base. And so I threw myself into that because I was sort of like, um, you know, an undifferentiated stem cell that was really excited to differentiate into something, but I didn't really, the thing I wanted to differentiate into was not materializing to the extent I wanted it to. So I had to redirect my differentiation in a different direction and throw all my passion and interest and focus and time to developing this new field of endoscopic skull-based surgery. And that was really the key because then suddenly I had an expertise that nobody in Manhattan really had. And very few people in the country and the world had. And I was able to do more and more of those cases, publish more and more papers on that, become a national and an international expert in that field because I got in early, I identified a, a need and you know, trained myself to be the best I could be and a, a leader and a thought leader in that area. And then the rest, everything followed from that because once your name is out there, you're thought of as an innovator and a thought leader, then people start sending you more tumors, different kinds of tumors, and you start you know, honing your skills and developing your skills and becoming a better surgeon. Your name gets out there, your reputation builds, and then everything built from that. I still do the epilepsy surgery, and I love doing it, and I still run a basic science epilepsy lab, and I'm still writing NIH grants and doing that, but 90% of my surgeries are now endoscopic skull base or brain tumor surgeries, gliomas, mets, meningiomas, what have you, you know, I'm really a brain tumor surgeon first and foremost, and I love it. I love doing that, and I love the technical expertise of, of doing that and pushing the frontier of that new field, and that's just become my new career and my new focus, and the epilepsy is more of a hobby, you know. Uh, it's like playing golf on the weekends. It's like something that I'm passionate about and I love doing, you know, but it's not my main uh, uh, focus that, that, you know, kind of keeps my my surgical practice going. Now on that same mindset, what would you say were the keys to your success in your early career that helped you climb to the top of the industry? You know, I think relentless pursuit of excellence and relentless, diligent, you know, paper writing, just constantly trying to do more, better, smaller opening, you know, going to conferences, listening to what other people are doing. Um, being flexible in terms of how you approach a case. And every case I do, I think to myself, there's gotta be a better way to do this. Like, what, how would I improve this operation? I learned how to do it this way. Maybe there's a better way to do it. And let me think about how I can make it better um, and make, do it through a smaller opening, make it less invasive, get the patient out of the hospital sooner, make it safer, but just as effective. Bring a new technology from another field into neurosurgery um, to, to make our field better. And it's that mindset of not being fixed in your ways and just saying, oh, this is the way we do it. We do it the same way every time. This is the way because it works. Because it doesn't always work. We know that. Every, every approach we have has pros and cons. There are complications. There are areas we can't see, things we can't get to. And so it's just that constant sense of, of movement and innovation as opposed to just sitting back and letting the cases come to you and just kind of doing them you know, the way you've always learned how to do it. Now, throughout your career, did you ever consider going private practice or were you academic focused all the way? So I did look at a couple of private practice jobs when I started out um, because I wanted to keep an open mind. You know, I wanted to kind of see what was out there. And I realized very early it wasn't for me. It just was not, I wasn't the right thing for my mindset. You know, I, I didn't view neurosurgery as a way to make a living. I viewed it more as a uh, field that needed to be developed that I wanted to study and, and constantly improve and, and research and be in an academic environment where um, I had the ability to, to innovate and change. Also, the other thing that's important about an academic center is that you can specialize in one area. You know, private practice, it was clear to me that I was gonna have to be a generalist, do all different kinds of surgery, do spine, you know, brain, whatever came in through the door, and that's great. And uh, being good at that is a great, 
you know, worthwhile passion, but I wanted to do just a limited number of surgeries that I knew I could do better and better and better and better and, and change the field. Now, seeing with your interaction with residents at your program, what type of advice do you have for the graduating chief residents and fellows as they enter that job search process for the first time? You know, I would, I would recommend to them that they figure out what's most important to them. You know, some people, geography is important. You know, they have family ties somewhere and neurosurgery is a very demanding career. They're not going to see their family as much. And if, if the geography is important, then you kind of narrow that down. But then maybe you don't get the perfect job within that geography. Um, but that's okay because whatever job you get, whatever you think you're going to be doing for your job can change. And, you know, you could be at a certain job doing one thing and then have a partner that does all of something else. And then that guy, that person leaves, that man or woman, whoever it is, leaves. And suddenly there's a, there's a vacuum and you may want to shift into that area. Or you could see parts of your practice developing and other parts atrophying. And, and you may want to focus on areas where you realize you're going to be able to do more work or better work. So I would say have some flexibility in terms of what you want to do, but also have a sense of what you're passion is and what's going to make you happy but but that can change you know just keep it in mind that that can change my I'm a great example of that you know what I thought I wanted to do um, was not what I ended up loving doing and so it's very hard to know as a resident what you're going to love doing as an attending um, obviously if you have a strong research interest you have to be in an environment that's going to allow that to be nurtured and you have to find a place where you have a mentor or someone else doing similar type of research where your lab can can work off of because that's very challenging to balance the two. Uh, you know, I'm a pure, I'm an academic guy. And so, you know, that's important to me. Um, and I guess that's a big differentiation you got to make as a resident. You want to do academic or private practice. It's a different way to practice surgery. And now thinking about the current situation where everything is basically virtual, similar to what we're doing right now. And a lot of these annual conferences have been canceled and been done on Zoom or Google meetups, whatever it might be. You know, what type of advice are you providing to these residents and fellows that could potentially be rubbing shoulders with you at a conference and now they don't have that ability? And so the outreach, I feel like, is a conversation that comes up a lot and how to get creative and how to actually continue to do that and interface with folks like yourself. You know, I think the virtual environment has only increased the ability to interact to some degree because, first of all, education-wise, there's so many Zoom webinars out there uh, that, that residents and junior faculty can listen to. Um, and, you know, there all these sort of international stuff that we used to do. We used to travel abroad to lecture in Singapore or wherever it was in China. We now can just sit at home and do it for an hour, not have to travel for three or four days. So it makes it much easier to interact with people. I, I think that in terms of the job search, often there's a lot of word of mouth that occurs. And if there's a resident in our program who I think is a great resident and who says to me, you know, I'm trying to find a job and I want to find a job in Florida, you know, I can get on the phone with the chairman of the departments uh, of the programs in Florida and say, hey, we got a guy here who's great. This is what he wants to do. He may be flexible. What are you looking for? What do you need? And so I think it's important to use your senior faculty member at your program, become friendly with them. Let them know what you want to do. Let them know roughly where you want to go. Um, and, you know, use them as a resource to try to advocate for, for you. Obviously, you're also going to send out your letters. You know, you're going to make phone calls to all the chairmen. You know, I got my job. I, you know, sent multiple letters and phone calls to the place I thought I wanted to go to let that person know, you know, I was very, very interested in moving to that program. Um, so you have to be very proactive. You have to be a go-getter. There's a spot there. Often, you know, program directors can make a spot for you. You know, they can, they can always try to hire one other person. Uh, but then you have to try, figure out what are they looking for? How can I fit a need that that person is looking for if I want to be at that particular program? And that's where the flexibility comes into play. So you get part of what you want, and you give the chairman part of what they want. Because they want to fill a need. You may have a different need and you have to kind of meet in the middle. Right. And now with you being in New York, can you kind of just give us your opinion or feedback on the current pandemic with COVID-19, how you see it being handled and potentially where you see it going? Yeah. You know, it's really remarkable because New York was the epicenter in the beginning and we get hit harder than anybody because we had the biggest spike. 
And the spike was the problem because it overwhelmed the healthcare system and shut us down. But the irony is that now we're one of the safest places in the country because we learned our lesson early. You know, we got hit in the face and we realized how serious this is. So everybody's wearing masks, everybody's social distancing. And so now it's an incredibly safe place to practice. We have almost no patients in the hospital with COVID. All our patients get tested beforehand. And we're now up to full speed doing all the cases we ever did um, safely. And, you know, there was that initial spike in New York and now the rest of the country is having this long, slow, prolonged wave. Much as it was difficult at the time, I actually feel gratitude and lucky that we went through what we did because now I feel like New York is going to be a very safe place going forward, you know, and we can be, we were leaders in the, in the COVID era. Now we can be leaders in the post COVID era because we've been through it. So how important do you think mentors are in the development of your career? So I think mentorship is incredibly important in a field like neurosurgery because it is so challenging to move up the ladder in neurosurgery. And ironically, um, I've had really two mentors in my career. One was more of a research mentor who was a neurosurgeon at a very young age. But the biggest mentor clinically to me, ironically, was not a neurosurgeon. He was actually an ENT surgeon. When I started doing what we call endoscopic skull day surgery, where you go up through the nose, use an endoscope, take out brain tumors, I started working with an ENT surgeon named BJ Anand, and he gave me the confidence and trained me in the skills to do this new type of surgery and sat with me through every case and encouraged me and was there to talk to me at you know, 10 o'clock at night or two in the morning when there were complications or problems or emotional issues that I had to deal with with patients or political issues and helped me get through all of that and to see where we were going because he was 10 years older than I was. He had been through it already with endoscopic sinus surgery. Um, it was an incredible mentor to me. And, and without his aid and assistance, I never would have been as successful as I was. And so the, the take home message is mentors are incredibly important, but, but they're not always right in front of you. You know, it may be someone who you don't think is gonna be your mentor, maybe in a different field uh, that you're gonna find a mentor. But um, if you can find one, they're invaluable. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.